You are listening to the Cheeky Podcast for Moms with IBD, a safe space where moms with Crohn's and colitis connect, explore powerful tools for healing, and transform our lives to thrive in motherhood and in life. I'm your host, Karen Haley, IBD health coach, integrative wellness enthusiast, and mom to three outstanding kids. After having Crohn's disease for 30 years and working as a health advocate exclusively with IBD clients for the last 10 years, I know it's time to bring the types of candid conversations I have with my clients out into the open. It's our time to go on an IBD healing journey and do it like only a mom can. Let's do this. Well, hey there, Mama. It's Karen here with you. I'm hoping you're having a day filled with loads of gut love. And if you're not, I'm here with a positive and hopefully enlightening message today that you can take with you to help you on your IBD journey. When it comes to Crohn's and colitis, I just cannot believe how much misinformation is out there, which makes it so challenging for us, the patient, to get reliable, accurate details about our illness. I think one of the reasons why we get so many mixed messages about how to best address our symptoms is because there is no cookie cutter, one size fits all approach to treating our illness. I've personally seen different women with seemingly the same symptoms and they respond completely in opposite ways. And at first it seems like a head scratcher. How can that be? Not knowing what advice to take and what to throw away for us, it creates a daunting task with a weight of a statement, kind of like something like, when I went to school, we had to walk 20 miles to and from in the freezing cold blizzard-like conditions, uphill both ways. I'm sure you've heard a statement like that from maybe an elderly relative before, but since I like to be more of a glasses half full kind of gal, I prefer to look at the challenge of knowing what message is true and honest as more like a choose your own adventure novel, where instead of someone else being in charge of what you do and how you do it, you're in charge. You're in charge of every IBD decision and you're responsible for how the journey turns out for you. Sure, there might be some missteps along the way, but at least with a choose your own adventure IBD book, you can go back and then you can have a do over with a completely different ending. Today, in the spirit of those choose your own adventure novels, I bet your kids are into, and if they're not into them, I bet you they're going to be into them soon. This episode, it can serve as a reminder that just like our kids who control the narrative with these books, When we have IBD, we have the power. We have the power and we're in control of our IBD destiny. Sounds a little bit corny and a little bit dramatic, but oh so true. Today, I'm going to share five common, really not so talked about pitfalls I see many moms with IBD making. Now, fortunately, these pitfalls or myths, as I call them, they're just like a choose your own adventure book. When you've experienced a not-so-happy ending on one path because you were led to believe a myth, it's not the end. It's not the end of the line for you. Instead, it's just an opportunity for you to go back and try again. Only this time, you're armed with more information. And with you at the helm of your IBD decisions, your journey is bound to have a happier ending next time. Let's dive into IBD myth number one goes like this. When it comes to treating IBD, you have to be either in the medical camp or the natural camp. There's no in between. This myth, I have to be honest with you guys, it drives me crazy. People just love to pigeonhole you and others into one camp or another. And at each camp, it's so interesting because each camp, they're so judgy of the other camp, aren't they? The natural camp thinks medicine is the work of the devil and that MDs and other doctors, they'll lead us to cancer-causing medications and Western medicine will never help us. And then there's the medication camp and they believe that people who prefer natural remedies, they're just tree-hugging, granola-loving hippies who don't have a clue about what it takes to actually feel better. Now, I always want to be honest with you guys, and if I am being 100% honest with you, 
I fall more into the natural camp. I always like to pick non-toxic things, a non-toxic way of doing things, a non-toxic approach that gets to the root cause of IBD before I choose the symptom management approach for my illness. But sometimes IBDers, and me included here, we need doctors and medication and hospitals and surgeries. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for these options. I'm so grateful that they're available to us. Lord knows that there's lots of doctors who have helped save me a time or two on this 30-year journey that I've had with Crohn's. The myth-busting approach to managing your IBD that I'm going to advocate for you with this myth, it's a way of thinking that excludes the idea of only medicine or only natural. And instead, it will incorporate what I like to call your wheel of wellness. I've talked about the wheel of wellness before on a previous podcast episode, but it's about relying not just on one thing to help you, but remembering that healing takes a village, a plethora of wellness tools to help you heal. These are the kinds of wellness tools that include having a really solid and honest relationship with your gastroenterologist, using meds when you need them, getting labs and procedures when they're warranted. But, and here's the big but, it's about also knowing the value at the same time of healing foods, restorative exercise like yoga or walking in nature, meditation, acupuncture, sleep hygiene, supplements, stress relief, and therapy. This way, this wheel of wellness way of helping your IBD, it gives you your best and most personalized chance for you to heal. When you put in the time, and it does take some time, but when you put in the time to build an amazing wheel of wellness, one that's built just for you, it's going to be at your disposal whenever and wherever you need it. Now, this approach to healing, it's what's termed an integrative medicine approach. It uses the best methods to heal from Western and Eastern perspectives. When you choose an integrative approach to manage your IBD, you embrace the health and everything it takes to make health happen for your whole body. Ignore the naysayers who tell you that the integrative approach is wrong. Just because it's wrong for them, it doesn't mean it's wrong for you. Remember, Crohn's and colitis are not diseases with a roadmap where there's only one way to get to your destination, or it's a book where at the end of the line, everything was linear. It went from one step to the next step. Our disease isn't like this, okay? With our disease, it's like talking about a detour or taking the road less traveled, taking a different way to get to your destination, maybe than anyone else. When it comes to IBD, make your own integrative roadmap. And then make health about the amazing journey that you'll take to get there. Let's go ahead and dive into myth number two, IBD myth number two. It doesn't matter what I eat. Food has nothing to do with Crohn's or colitis. Now, I am never one to contradict a doctor. After all, they did go to medical school. But I've got to say, how is it possible that an illness that affects your whole digestive tract How is it possible that the food you eat doesn't impact your gut or your illness? Now, does that make any sense to you? I mean, it's really just common sense. Does that make sense? It truly doesn't. The thing is, it's not the doctor's fault here. The food you eat impacting your IBD, it's just not something that they're trained in. Doctors, they're trained in disease management, not nutrition. I've heard that medical school training only involves just a quick blip in nutrition, like three hours. I pray that's not true, but whatever that number of hours is, I know it's small. So it's no wonder that nutrition in the food you eat is rarely brought up in a visit with your IBD doctor, beyond maybe saying something like, don't eat the things that bother you, or something like, eat bland. You may have heard those things before, but anything beyond that, not so much. Thankfully, though, I do have to say, I'm seeing ideas about the effects of IBD and the food we eat. There's a, li- there's a slight shift there. I know ever so slightly, but that's how wheels turn in medicine, slightly. And that's thanks to research that's become more mainstream in the last few years regarding our microbiome. 
That's that community of bacteria that lives inside and outside of our body. This microbiome research is what all of us with IBD need to make sure we're paying really close attention to because it's likely to be the key that finally helps us make large leaps in putting IBD behind us for good. I just love perusing IBD and microbiome research because it's so promising and it's so exciting. I know, I'm weird, a little, but I do, I get a little giddy about it because it's really cool. I think it's going to lead to some tremendous breakthroughs in how Crohn's and colitis are treated. And eventually, I think it's going to eradicate, help to eradicate the disease in the next several years. All right, fingers crossed, we can hope, right? The microbiome research, research it brings attention to how the bacteria in our gut can be positively or negatively impacted by the food we eat. By eating foods that are rich in the beneficial bacteria and then taking away foods that promote the bacterial dysbiosis in our body, that's that bacterial imbalance, we can see how IBD could improve and then how we could thrive. If there's one thing that I know doctors love, it's empirical evidence produced by research. So stay tuned on that food has nothing to do with your illness front, that myth, because I think as IBD in the microbiome continues to be studied and researched and then more studies are published, you're going to see a shift happen so that when you ask your doctor the question, does what I eat matter, you might just get a different response. I'll link to one of my favorite microbiome studies in the show notes, just in case you're a study research geek like me and you want to read about how IBD and the microbiome interact just in case you're curious in these latest advances, but really it's a very cool front and I think we're gonna be seeing more in this area to change this myth. Let's move on to myth number three. Myth number three about IBD is if it isn't visible, it's not so bad. Of course, of course this myth is referring to IBD being an invisible illness because what's going on on the outside of our body isn't what's going on beneath the surface. This is really a different kind of myth because it's not a myth that we believe in, but it's one believed by those around us. And what I think makes this one even worse than the other invisible illnesses, but worse for us with IBD, and why it just has to be debunked today, is that opposed to other invisible illnesses, our disease isn't only invisible, it's also taboo. The taboo part has a lot to do with a subject that affects us greatly, but no one talks about, and that's poop. So having an invisible illness, that's really bad enough. That's hard enough for people. It forces us to constantly remind our friends and loved ones that even though we might look okay, oftentimes we actually aren't okay. And oftentimes as moms, we move to the opposite direction. We try our hardest to ignore the pain, ignore the bathroom trips, ignore the symptoms because we don't have time for it. And we also don't like to burden others with it. That mom guilt strikes again. We constantly get people saying things to us like, huh, but you don't look too sick. I don't even know how to respond to that. How do you even respond when somebody says that? Plus, because we're talking about poop and pop poop is a taboo topic, we never get the recognition for how challenging this illness is. So it's really a double whammy here with this invisibility and this taboo subject. But let me let you in on a little poorly kept secret. Are you ready for it? Here it is. Everyone poops. I said it, everyone poops. Some have more poops than others, but everyone poops. Your partner, your kids, your boss, your neighbor, your friend, even that hot celebrity that you don't know but you swoon over, they poop too. Everyone poops. When it comes to those who perpetuate the myth that our illness isn't as bad, isn't as bad as other chronic illnesses because it's invisible and it doesn't show up, outside our bodies and we don't have a right to talk about it because some of the symptoms have to do with that P word, she says in quotes. I say, you know what I say? That's their problem. That's their problem. We don't have to buy into the myth that we are less than or not worthy because we have a digestive illness. 
all the IBD moms that I know, they're amazingly strong, resilient, smart as hell, gutsy as all get out, and capital B, you thought I was going to say something else, but capital B, beautiful. So no more hiding in the shadows, mama, because someone else is uncomfortable with you. I know how you feel because it took me way, way, way too many years to realize this for myself. And I'm hoping that you never go through the shame and embarrassment that I felt about IBD and our invisible illness and especially the taboo part of it, the taboo part of talking about the P word. Hold your head high, my love. You are a warrior and a goddess. Myth number four, IBD myth number four is, I can't eat fruits and vegetables because they go right through me. Now, first of all, I know that fruits and vegetables, they can be challenging for us IBDers. I've experienced those challenges myself, especially when I'm in a flare. And it's not unusual for me to hear from a client that the food that when it is when it goes through them, it looks very much the same as it goes in as it goes out. I don't think I said that right, but you know what I mean. It looks the same when it goes in and then comes out in the toilet. There's undigested pieces of carrot, pieces of lettuce, skins of tomatoes, blueberries, or peas. Those are common foods that I hear about going straight through you without digesting at all. So it's only natural that you think, well, I can't eat fruit and I can't eat veggies at all because I don't tolerate them. And unfortunately, when this happens, Many IBDers, they reach for comfort food. And I'm saying that in quotes now, comfort food, in the form of things like mashed potatoes and mac and cheese with the belief that they're easier to digest. Okay, it's time for me to give it to you straight. Give it to you straight with love, of course, but I really have to be firm about this here. These foods are actually the worst things you can have in a flare the worst things you can have. Complex carb-rich starches like white potatoes, pasta, white bread, they're only gonna feed the bad bacteria in your gut and make your IBD troubles worse in the long run. Don't fall for this. Don't fall for the comfort food myth that it makes you feel comforted in the moment. Instead, let's bust this myth by trying to figure out ways to incorporate nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables, more than fruits even, vegetables, into your diet. Even when you're having a Crohn's or colitis flare-up, it can be done. It really can. It's all about figuring out how you can eat these foods and make them easier for your body to digest and absorb. That's the key there. It means that not only in a way that your body can break down the particles of the food, right, that's the digestion piece, the breaking down of the particles, but also in a way that you can then absorb the nutrients to bust that flare. So we are not only breaking down the particles in the digestion, but then we're absorbing the nutrients into our bloodstream to give us health and nutrition to fight the flare. And when we do that, then we won't see these little bits in the toilet. Let's take lettuce, for example. During an IBD flare, raw salads are usually out because you can't digest them. But that doesn't mean that all greens should be excluded and avoided from your diet. With greens, I highly encourage you to experiment with greens like spinach or beet greens. I particularly like these because they're a little bit easier to digest than, let's say, kale or mustard greens because they're very fibrous and very hearty greens. So I'm talking about things like spinach and beet greens, the more fragile, gentle greens. They can be completely pulverized in a smoothie. Greens are really a great way to get lots of vitamins and minerals, vitamin C, folate, iron, magnesium, and antioxidants. All we have to do is blend them in a high-speed blender to create a form of the greens that our body can digest and absorb. I did say high-speed blender there, so know that if you don't have a high-speed blender, I probably wouldn't recommend this for you. This works best in a high-speed blender where you can really pulverize the green. 
But now, if even doing this is too much for your sensitive gut, and I have seen this before, I've actually experienced this myself too, where you're, it's just in too severe fit, a flare that you can't even do that. Think about adding greens to a stew or a soup that's cooked longer than normal. Because when we cook it longer than normal, we really break down the food. We're already pre-digesting it before we put it into our body. It breaks down the fiber in these greens. It just makes it much easier to digest and then absorb the nutrients. One of my absolute favorite ways to get veggies in, and this is not just greens, but all veggies, one of my favorite ways to get them in during a flare-up when you're struggling to digest food is with my 15 veggie soup. I know, I don't know if that sounds good to you or not. It sounds good to me, but oh my gosh, it's delicious. I start with a base of bone broth. And with that, of course, homemade is best. There are some store-bought options that I think are okay, like kettle and fire and bona fide provisions if you can't make your own. But I would say homemade is best if you can. And then to that, I add 15 of my favorite veggies. But it could be whatever you have on hand, and it doesn't have to be 15. Just off the top of my head, usually my favorite 15 that I just always have in my house would be things like carrots, zucchini, broccoli, asparagus, onions, peas, cauliflower, I'm counting on my hand, and tomatoes, green beans, yellow squash, spinach, mushrooms, let's see, scallions, um, celery, I think that was 15. I hope that was 15. But anyway, that's about 15. And I just kind of scavenge in my refrigerator and see what I have. Those are my favorites, but your favorites could be completely different. I add some salt and pepper and oregano and thyme to that. So now I have the vegetables, the seasonings, and the broth in a large stock pot. I bring it to a boil, and then I simmer it with the lid on until the vegetables get very soft. And I'm talking mushy soft, right? If you're seeing your food in the toilet after you go, I'm talking mushy soft here, something you can really digest. Now, you might be thinking that that's where the soup story ends. I just serve it up from there. But actually, if you're struggling to digest your food, especially your fruits and vegetables, and you're not breaking them down, let's go ahead and break this down even further to its simplest form. And the way we do that is by putting it in a blender when it's done. And so what you're left with is this really rich, creamy, delicious, nutritious, nutrient-dense, easy to digest and absorb healthy meal that your gut will love. In fact, you'll hear your gut. It'll actually say, thank you. It'll say that to you. I promise. Just wait. So the bottom line here is to get your nutrients however you can. Just because you can't eat a salad raw, it doesn't mean you can't eat greens, right? We talked about how you could put them in a smoothie. And just because regular cooked carrots might go straight through you, that doesn't mean you have to give up on carrots altogether. It's about putting them in a form that works for your current state of your body. And there's many ways to do this. And if you're struggling with how to get your fruit and veggies in, I want you to get in touch. I'm happy to help you with this. Maybe it deserves its own podcast episode, actually, because this is really a big topic. So if this is something you're struggling with, let me know. I'll put it in a a future episode. But if you want to, you can reach out to me. Hello at KarenHaley.com. Remember, my mom had to be just a little different and spell my name with a Y. So it's K-A-R-Y-N-H-A-L-E-Y. Hello at KarenHaley.com. Reach out and we'll figure it out together. But when you do this, when you put your nutrients in a form that your body can digest and absorb, you give your digestive system a chance to calm down and repair with foods that heal, as opposed to those comfort foods that are hurting you in the long run. And once your gut has time to rest and reset, then you can start moving back into eating soup without pureeing it. Once you get that far, you can start with the soup itself or whatever you're making with the veggies that are just cooked. After that, and you're tolerating those, then you move into lightly steamed veggies. And finally, into raw. Seems like a really unimaginable goal, doesn't it? I know if you're right now, if you're listening to this and you're at the I'm seeing food in the toilet stage, you might be thinking, no, 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 no. Yes, you can do this. You can do this. It may take some time. 
It may take some healing and repair of the intestinal lining, but it is possible. I've seen it happen time and time again, and it's definitely worked for me. So I hope, I hope you can imagine that for yourself because it is possible. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to see what's possible when we give the gut time, the time it needs to heal, instead of immediately going to comfort food that doesn't really give any comfort at all. I just want to give you just a couple more quick thoughts on this myth before we move on. When it comes to fruit, you might not be able to eat an apple or blueberries raw, but how about cooking those down? I love making a blueberry compote, which is just blueberries that I heat in a pan. I like to add a little bit of vanilla to it because it makes the blueberry flavor pop, but nothing else, just the blueberries and the vanilla. If your blueberries are not frozen, you might want to add just a touch of water, but just a touch, just so it doesn't burn. But after I cook it down for a while, then I puree the blueberries into a digestible form. See how I did that? I took them from a raw blueberry, which I know that I can't digest, to a digestible form because it's now been cooked and heated and blended, right? We broke those fibers down. You can then store that in your refrigerator as a topper for yogurt, or I like to put it on my grain-free pancakes or my grain-free scones. All the health of a blueberry without the difficulty of digesting it in its raw form. Another idea for your consideration could be juicing. Juicing is another way to get nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables into your diet. The juicing removes the skins, the seeds, and the fiber, and it makes it easier to digest. So you're, now you're getting gut healing nutrients without the harsh digestion that our body is just not ready for. Remember though, and you know, if, if you're multitasking, I want you to come back to me now because this is the key here to this myth. The ultimate goal here is to be eating a combination of both raw and lightly cooked fruits and vegetables in their whole and natural state. But most of us with IBD, when we're in a flare, we can't start there. We have to give our intestinal wall time to repair and eating fruit and vegetables in more digestible ways. This is where we start. This is where you start with that. Okay, moving on to our last myth, myth number five. I have IBD because I'm a perfectionist who can't handle stress, anxiety, and pressure. Who's been told it's all in your head? Just calm down, little girl. Who's been told that before? Amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah, I know. Lots of us have been told that. Hell to the no. First of all, you're an awesome mama who juggles more things in a day than anyone can imagine. And I could just leave it at that because let's face it, enough said, right? I don't even need to say more. But I will say just a bit more on this topic because I'm here, you're here. So why not let's thoroughly bust this myth? You didn't get IBD because you can't cope with stress. Although the prevailing views in the 1950s were just that. IBD was thought of as more of a psychiatric diagnosis. But thankfully, research has come a long way with theories about the causes of IBD. In fact, today we know a lot more about the reason for autoimmune disorders like IBD. And that's thanks to the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano. He's a medical doctor, a gastroenterologist, and a researcher in the area of autoimmunity. Dr. Fasano describes autoimmune diseases with this really cool, I love his approach, with this three-legged stool analogy. Can you picture this? Can you picture a three-legged stool? I love this because it's so easy to picture. Everybody can picture a stool with three legs. If that stool lost one of its legs, it really wouldn't function anymore, would it? Dr. Fasano's research shows that for autoimmunity to occur, three legs of the stool or three criteria must be in place. Number one is genetics. Certain genes we have, they make us more susceptible to IBD, so we're born with those. Number two, the leg of the stool, number two is the trigger. Although the exact trigger for IBD is unknown, there is some sort of trigger that then causes the body to attack itself. And the leg of the stool, number three, third leg of the stool, is intestinal permeability, which is just a fancy word for leaky gut. It's called either one, but it's called leaky gut often or intestinal permeability. This is where the intestines get weak and leaky 
and then protein from food part particles and bacteria, they enter into our bloodstream. This is what then causes this autoimmune reaction. So definitely not a good thing. The whole autoimmune process, it could create other autoimmune diseases in other people, like lupus or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis. For us, the three-legged stool of autoimmunity, it created inflammatory bowel disease. And possibly, you might even have other autoimmune diseases as well, because once you have one, you might find that others will pop up into the mix too. The bottom line here is that, rest assured, you didn't get IBD because you're a perfectionistic stress monster. It's interesting to note, though, that while stress didn't cause your illness, current research does, does show that stress does affect our illness. See that? It's a subtle difference in words. Subtle difference there, but it actually makes a huge difference in the meaning. So stress didn't cause IBD, but it can make it worse at times. I'm sure you've had stressful moments in your life, especially moments of chronic or more long-term stress where you noticed your Crohn's or colitis, it suffered because of it. COVID-19 is a perfect example of a chronic stressful life event that can negatively impact your IBD, but really any long-term stress can do this. The key to busting this type of impact is to have stress-busting tools at your fingertips for when life gets stressful and all tangled up with your IBD struggles. If stress is a big part of your life right now and you're looking for ways to manage it, you can get a copy of my stress management tool belt at karenhaley.com forward slash stress. That's K-A-R-Y-N-H-A-L-E-Y dot com forward slash stress. It's filled with easy mom-centered suggestions to help you manage your stress. It's definitely worth getting because I know in your life right now, there's probably a lot of stress and it will be there for you when you need it. Well, Mama, we made it to the end of our five IBD myths, and we busted each and every one of them. A virtual high five for us. But I wouldn't be me if I didn't leave you with a few honorable mentions for this myth debunking episode so you can do myth busting like the mom I know you are. Here's just a few more what I'll call quick hits for myths that deserve a quick mention. Okay, so here's one honorable mention. IBD only affects your intestines. Total and complete myth. IBD is an autoimmune disorder like we just talked about with inflammation at its core. So that inflammation and the immune dysfunction, it can show up anywhere in your body, including places like your joints, your skin, your eyes. It's important for you to know this because when you have seemingly non-gut related symptoms and they creep up for you, you'll want to mention those to your IBD doctor as well because they might be related to your Crohn's or colitis. All right, another honorable mention myth, I'll never find a doctor who understands me. Total and complete myth. I know it might seem impossible, but yes, it's a myth. While I will say it's hard to find a good doctor who listens, understands, and supports your healing journey in the way that you need them to, it's possible. It took me a long time to find this for myself, but yes, it's possible. I want you to go check out episode number 10 to help you find a doctor that you'll rave about to all your friends. I'll link to it in the show notes. Last honorable mention that I just want to mention before we wrap up, and that's this. There's one diet out there that cures IBD. No, no, nobody, nope, no. This is a myth, and don't let anyone tell you different. First of all, I'm not a fan of the word cure. And secondly, there's actually lots more than one special diet that works to help diminish your IBD symptoms. Picking the diet that fits your own personal needs and then making that diet your own. So you're not just picking out the diet that works for you, but once you do that, then you're making that diet your own. That is what healing is all about. That's what using food to heal is all about. I get really revved up about this topic, this 
eating for IBD and finding the best diet for you to follow. I just really love this topic. It's something, it's my happy place. It's my zone of genius. I get so revved up about it actually that I'm actually in the middle of creating a training all about how you can find the best diet when it comes to your IBD. So stay tuned for that. I will let you know as soon as it's ready for you to check out. All right, we've made it to the end of another episode of the Cheeky Podcast for Moms with IBD. I'm so happy that you joined me today. Debunking IBD myths is fun, and I hope this information sparks some ahas for you today. Now, go run with it and start chipping away at the IBD in your life. You've got this. I'm just your weekly reminder of all that's possible. And a healthy life with IBD is in your sights if you keep rocking it with baby steps. Go for it. You've got this. Remember, if you're enjoying the podcast, now is the perfect time to leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be the perfect holiday present for me. A five-star rating would be awesome and good karma for sure. Ratings and reviews help us reach more IBD mamas. And that is a beautiful thing. Until we meet again, I'm wishing you a cheeky and healthy IBD journey. Chat soon. Thank you so much for joining me today and for listening to today's episode. When it comes to IBD, I know there's a lot of resources out there and I'm truly honored that you chose the Cheeky Podcast to get your IBD information today. If you found this information helpful, please give us a rating and review. It helps other moms find the podcast and see what we're doing over here to help IBD moms everywhere. And if you feel called to do it, share this podcast with an IBD mom who you know could really use an uplifting message today, because that's what we're all about over here at the Cheeky Podcast. One last thing, if you're still with me, and if you are, you're definitely my kind of gal. We have to get to know each other better. If you're tired of living on the hamster wheel of IBD with all the ups and downs between flares and remission, if you're struggling to get control of your abdominal pain, gas, bloating, diarrhea, and other troubling IBD symptoms, go to my website. It's karenhaley.com, and my mom had to be just a little bit different, spell my name with a Y. So it's K-A-R-Y-N-H-A-L-E-Y.com, and schedule your very own free 30-minute IBD root cause troubleshooting session with me, where... We discuss the challenges you've been having, we set goals to help you move forward, and we talk about how we can work together to help you get your life back. It's a power-packed 30 minutes. You don't have to live in IBD status quo. There's so much that can be done to transform your life so you can thrive in motherhood and thrive with IBD. I've seen my clients walk this path and it gives me so much joy to take that journey with them. My entire coaching practice is run online, so you never have to leave your house and you never have to get out of your jammy or yoga pants for us to work together. You know I'm wearing them too. If you're ready to take your first amazing step towards healing, I'm ready to chat with you. Schedule your free 30-minute IBD root cause troubleshooting sesh today at karenhaley.com. Click on the work with me tab and I'll see you soon. It's important to note that the information in this podcast and in this episode is for general information purposes only and not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. The statements made in the Cheeky Podcast for Moms with IBD, either by me or my guests, is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Before implementing any new treatment protocols, do yourself a favor and consult your physician first. Thank you so much for listening, for being here, for saving this space for us to spend some time together. Until we chat again, I'm wishing you a cheeky and healthy IBD journey.